Okay, welcome everybody to uh, this year's Dia del Niñe program at Cal State LA. I'm Leti Terrones, I'm a librarian at Cal State LA. And um, I'm so honored uh, to be here with Professor Enrique Ochoa and our guest authors, Doctora Oriel Maria Siu and Aida Salazar. And the University Library greatly appreciates the sponsorship and the spirit of collaboration from the Department of Anthropology, the Urban Learning Program in the, in the Charter College of Education, the Chicana OX and Latina OX Studies Department, the Glazer Family Dreamers Resource Center, the Department of Latin American Studies and the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Department, whose generous support makes it possible to invite today's special guests. And as a special shout out, I would like to um, shout out all the librarians and the children's literature scholars, advocates, and the mentors, all the loved ones, uh, and uh, especially all of the students in the house. Thank you so much for spreading the word about today's special event. Um, if you want to in the chat, um, please go ahead, particularly the students, introduce yourselves. Um, if you're a member of the community, you could also put your name and the organization um, that you represent. Uh, and um, yeah, we know, and especially that in the crowd today, we have many students who are zine makers. We have students who are illustrators, students who are writers and thinkers. And uh, many of you are future or perhaps present children's literature authors or illustrators. So really we wanna, um, uh, we want to uplift your voices today, students. We encourage you to put in your questions into the chat for our wonderful guests. Uh, Dia del Niñe at Cal State LA is so honored to have Aida Salazar and Doctora uh, Oriel Maria Siu read from their books and talk to us about the contributions that their books make in the fight for migrant justice and political activism in resisting the criminalization and incarceration of migrant and refugee children along militarized borders. Aida and Doctora Siu will first read from their books and then se we'll segue into a conversation facilitated by Professor Enrico Ochoa and myself. And I wanna again encourage all the students in the house, many of whom are representing our undocu grad student body. So please don't be shy, put your questions into the Q&A or in the chat, send those in. And um, before um, the, we will introduce each author before they dive in to read from their books. I also want to make a note that we engage today's program on the unceded lands of the Tangva Gabrielino Nation, who are the original peoples of the territories that surround Cal State LA. Our lives and intellectual inquiry as faculty, as students, and as staff and community members at this public university are made possible because of the Tongva to whom I would like to express generous or express my gratitude for their generosity in protecting and taking care of this land and for fighting for the world and for our subsistence on it and for their enduring struggle uh, and sacrifice to protect life, water and land. And Dia de Niñe also emerges from uh, Latinx cultural production and diaspora. In 1996, Pat Mora, a Chicana scholar and poet and educator founded this family literacy initiative after learning about El Dia de los Niños as a national holiday held throughout many Latin American countries. Pat Mora's vision in collaboration with Reforma, the National Association to Promote Library and Information Services to Latinx peoples and, and Spanish speaking peoples led to the adoption of DIA or Children's Day as a US library initiative. Every year throughout April, libraries across the US organize DIA events to amplify literacies in all of their forms. And at Cal State LA, we are queering DIA by refashioning it as DIA del Niñe to signal how literature for youth by and for people of color has a strong ongoing tradition in resisting colonial empire. Queering Dia is important because it contributes to the wide 
diasporic resistance to patriarchy, which is an apparatus of settler colonialism and extractive capitalism. By Nigné, we challenge the gender binary and amplify gender expansiveness. Feminists in Latin America use the E, the letter E, to challenge the limits of the O and the A, and as a resistance to the sexism in language. So our authors today also contribute to this ongoing resistance of oppression wide, cross, uh, cross uh, uh, oppression writ large by writing. And so uh, it's now my honor and pleasure to introduce Aida Salazar, uh, who will be doing the first reading. Aida Salazar is a Mexican born US race award winning translator, author, and uh, award winning author, a translator, an arts activist whose writing for adults and for children explore issues of identity and social justice. She's the author of the critically acclaimed middle grade verse novels, The Moon Within, one of my all time favorites, who's won numerous awards, including the Americas Award, and The Land of Cranes, which has also won numerous awards from the Jane Addams Peace Honor Award, the NCTE Charlotte Hook Honor Award, the California Library Association Beattie Award, um, and was also recognized by uh, the Center for the Study of Multicultural Children's Literature. Um, and her, four, her forthcoming books include a picture book anthology called In the Spirit of a Dream, 13 Stories of Immigrants of Color. Look for that one this fall. Um, also look out for her picture book biography on Hobi, called Jovita War Pants, the story of a revolutionary fighter that's coming out in 2022. A historical novel, A Seed in the Sun, which is about the pivotal moments of the 1960s UFW strike. And also the anthology, The Gift, Writings on Menstruation by, uh, M, by authors of color, MG authors of color. Um, her translations um, are out this year. They include um, Bas by Baptiste and Miranda Paul, illustrated by Aceli Mesa, um, Ojalá Supieras um, by Jackie Ausa Kramer, illustrated by Magdalena Mora, and Never Forgotten, uh, which is written by Alejandra Algorta, illustrated by Ivan Ritterman. And we really appreciate the translations. Um, because oftentimes those are how our picture books get into our library collections. Aida also is a founding member of Las Musas, a Latinx kids lit author collective. So for all of you students out there wanting to um, try experimenting with writing um, Latinx kids lit, look out for Las Musas. She's the founder of Latinx Luna, a collective of menstruators challenging period stigmas in Latinx communities. And um, one really special note as, as someone who really loves ballet, her story by the light of the moon was adapted into a ballet production um, by the Sonoma Conservatory of Dance. And it's the first Chicana themed ballet in history. And Aida lives with her family of artists in a teal house in Oakland, California. Aida? Wow, thank you so, so much, Leticia, Enrique, Cal State LA Library, Kelsey. Thank you so much for having us um, and having this conversation, this really important conversation. And thank you all who are here today. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I want to start with the book trailer. Uh, the book that I'll be reading from today and talking about mostly is this one. It's called Land of the Cranes. And, um, and I'm gonna, just going to share the trailer. It's like a movie trailer, but for the book. And it'll give you a sense of what, what it's about. So just give me a second. And um, all right, you see that? All right, here we go. When Petita's family migrated to East LA, her father told her they were like birds who've come home to Aslan, land of the cranes. Petita loves to fly on Papi's shoulders, to dance with mommy and Papi, and write picture poems in her fourth grade class. 
But then one day, Papi is taken away by ICE and sent to Mexico. And soon, Mommy and Betita are trapped inside a cage with other migrants. When this unimaginable cruelty threatens to tear them down, will Betita find a way for her voice to inspire change? When Petita's family might... <laughs> All right. Okay, so that's, um, that's the trailer. And now I'm going to read to you from the book. Again, this, this story is told in verse, which is a series of poems. And um, it's, a, it's a novel, but it's told in a series of poems. And this is the first poem. And it's told through Petita, who's nine years old. It's her voice. My papi says long ago, our people came from a place called Aslan, the land of the cranes, which is now known as the Southwestern US. They left Aslan to fulfill their prophecy, to build a great city in the navel of the universe, a small mound in the middle of a lake where they saw an eagle devour a serpent on a cactus. They called that place Mexica Tenochtitlan, it was also prophesied our people would return to Aslan to live among the cranes again. So this is her in ho at home. She lives in East LA. What I know, I know my school's shiny floors, a broken water fountain and box chocolate milk I buy for 50 cents. I know Miss Martinez and her happy handshakes at her door before each grade, each fourth grade morning. I know how to write and draw the picture poems Miss Martinez taught us to paint our feelings. I know to never forget to scribble my name and date on the bottom. I know recess on the blacktop and the length of my golden brown crane wings in the desert sun. I know my BFF Amparo climbs Los Columpios like wind. I know aftercare until 6 p.m. when Papi comes to get me between his two jobs and carries me home on his strong shoulders so high I find flight. So this is, um, this is Betita here with her father being carried home. She believes she's a bird, right? That's her, that's her thing. She waits for her father and one day her father doesn't come, waiting. On Monday, Papi must be late. It's 6 p.m. and aftercare closes at 6.15. The ticks on the clock are honey, slow talks. I try not to count. I wonder if Papi's broken a wing on the skyscrapers he helps build with hammers and steel. I wonder if Papi forgot I'm waiting and rush to the restaurant with too many dishes to wash. But that has never happened. Miss Cassandra, the teacher's aide, bends the creases of her forehead near her phone when Papi doesn't answer. So she calls Mommy, who is the nanny of toddler twins with bright red cheeks who can't fly. Miss Cassandra gives me a tissue to soak up my teariness because Mommy can't come for me right now either. She can't leave those babies until their parents get home. Papi is coming, I whisper to myself. I'll tuck my wings close and wait. So it turns out her father has been deported in a work raid. And, and this, is, um, this is her conversation with her, her mother walls. On the bus home, mommy says here in El Norte, there are walls we were not supposed to cross. We are seen papeles, undocumented, her voice trembles. A word that means without permission. 
I reminded mommy, this is the land of the cranes. We have wings that can soar above walls. See, sí, amor, but not when they have cages and can stop us from flying. She sweeps me into a one-handed hug and kisses the top of my head. I watch the traffic turn from smooth to crowded through the window of the bus taking us home. So as you can imagine, she's nine years old and doesn't understand the severity um, of what's happening. So her father's been deported and um, they make a plan to try and meet him in at French and Park, which is in San Diego, a place where you can talk to your relatives who are on the other side of the border through the fence. And um, so they try and meet him there, but they miss the last exit. And when they try to come back, they, um, at, at the border, this is what happens. She's with her Tio Juan and her Tia and, and her mom and, and her cousin, Tina. So they're with, with the whole family. They were all gonna see um, her father, but now they're at the border. Chichimeca warriors. Tio Juan's face grows red as he argues, helicopter arms moving in every direction. Suddenly, one of the agents takes Tia Raquel by the arm and walks her over to an SUV. Tia Raquel begins to cry, turns back to scream at Tio Juan and Tina, my cousin. Please don't let them, let them take me, please. Before I know it, an agent has mommy by the arm too, but mommy shakes free. E espera, espera, wait, no, no, we need asylum. That's what the papers say. He grabs her by the arm again and says coldly, this isn't enough, you're going in. I run to hold mommy around the waist and shout loud at him. I am a brave Chichimeca warrior. You will not take my mommy too. Mommy clutches me cl close. But my daughter, she begs. She's going in with you, he cuts. Tina and Tio Juan's shock spills off their faces. Their eyes bounce wild across us. Tina lifts a quick hand with her phone to record it. I swing an angry arm like a sword at him. I repeat louder, I am a brave Chichimeca warrior. But the angry faced agent just slaps my hand away. I spread my wings to fly, but before I take flight, they drag us into the SUV with Tia Raquel clipping our wings when the door slams shut. So, um, They've been taken inside. And this is the moment that they walk into La Yelera. Silver Capes. We walk into the ice monster's maze of chain link skirts, cages filled with cranes, more shades of tan and brown than I've ever seen. Families captured, sad faced, worried faced, crying faced distant faced, some lying down, some standing, arms crossed, others sitting, no longer wearing wings, but silver capes that crinkle, crackle each time they move or pull the capes closer to their bodies. Coughs, babies crying, people speaking are all a murmur in my ears the capes shuffling and sounding so loud and inside my ears. Is this where we are headed when mommy and me are handed a folded cape each? Some of them see us and I can tell they feel sorry for us. Some stare away from us, maybe wondering when they will be free. Others close their eyes and clench their fists like I sometimes do when wishing for a nightmare to be over. And this is Betita there. Uh, so um, 
essentially um, their, their asylum papers have been denied and they're waiting now in, in the Yelera. And as they wait, they're, they're meeting um, other people. And this is the moment they meet um, the almost unaccompanied minors, which um, she calls almost solas in Aslan. That's the title of this, this, this piece there. Mommy gathers the stories about the almost solitas in broken bits and pieces. They are in charge of their siblings. They're looking for their mothers. They're running from their fathers. They were threatened by gangs. They've lost their way. They need to work to send help back home. Home in Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and Mexico, like us. They are cranes whose song-like names I try to catch in my brain. Roxanne, Marie, Allison, Claudia, Joanna. They don't trust us, so I tell them about the prophecy in my best papi Spanish. The Mexica people came from Aslan, the place of the cranes, which we think was an island on a misty lake here in El Norte. Seven tribes including the Mexica traveled south like cranes when Huitzilopochtli, who? The God of War announced his prophecy. They said that, that they would move south to build their great civilization in the ombligo of the world. De veras? How can this be true? Because my papi told me so. He said Aslan is our ancestral homeland and all migrants have come back home but they turn away like they don't believe a little kid they just met like me. All sorts of very terrible things happen to them. Um, and um, there's a dreamer who comes in. The dreamer is um, a young woman who, um, who's uh, upon entering gets beaten by the guards. And this is uh, her the next day, the wildest crane. I wake to someone talking loudly. When I look over, I see it's Maricel and I cover my face with my hand. I mean, why don't they turn it up in here? The heat, it's so cold because it's a form of torture, that's why. Just like my beat down, that's the kind of torture too. And taking away niños from their parents in here, dang, that's the worst kind of torture. It's straight jacked up. You see, they don't want this to be cool like we're at summer camp or something. They want it to be as cruel as possible so that we want to leave this country. She's speaking in a sing-song way and moves her hands and arms like she's a rapper. And she's talking to a teen and her sister who got here a few days ago. Pero what they don't want to admit is that our people have been here since before they were there were borders. We are indigenous to the land, this land, and they they are the illegal Im immigrants who came to this continent without an invitation and colonized. And here we are having to wait in this freezing freaking cage, having to put up with all their mistreatment just so that we can get permission to live in this damn country. The whole cell is awake now listening her, to her say things I didn't know. When the teen asks her where she is from, her talking gets faster. Technically in Mexico, but in reality, I spent most of my life in Southeast LA and so have my parents and all of my friends. But like I said, these are the Americas and I'm indigenous to this place, just like you. Something about how she is saying what is she is saying pulls me and Yanela over and we sit to listen to Maricel keep spinning her words into our ears. Mira, I'm a dreamer and I had to do all sorts of things to get DACA, you know, deferred action for childhood arrivals, which was supposed to protect me, but that didn't stop them from putting me in here. I was at a rally at the border and made a speech about the abuse of the immigrant community by ICE. I locked arms with people to build a bridge between Mexico and here, but because I happened to stand on the Mexican side of the border, they said I violated my DACA by crossing and threw me in here. They're trying to deport me now. I did nothing but speak out. Dang, if I had my phone, I'd be posting about this right now to my 10,000 followers. 
it would go viral. I'm trying to understand Maricel, her loud sing-song raps despite her two growing black eyes and swollen lip. How is it that she has more followers than my cousin Tina? The thing she knows about our history that is sort of like Bobby but angrier? And she's teaching us like mommy, but wilder. I've never met a crane like her before. <clears throat> so that's Maricel. And through Maricel's example, um, Betita uses her, uh, her uh, power to, to write picture poems, not her power, but her, her ability to write picture poems. She writes these poems that, um, that are, express her feelings, like she said in the beginning. And, um, and so she teaches the other people inside the detention center how to write these picture poems and their attorney gets them out and helps um, make some change inside the, the, um, the detention center. And I'm gonna end with this, um, this, this last piece here. It's a, it's a letter. So, so Betita um, is, um, helps make a change inside the detention center and outside and the conditions and whatnot, but her mother is still, um, her mother is pregnant and she um, is taken to a hospital. And so this little girl is inside the detention center by herself and over technicality, she can't get out. And, um, but her father who is in Mexico sends her a letter. And this is the letter um, that I'm gonna end with. It's from her father uh, who told her about the myth of Aslan and her belief in being a crane. And, um, and uh, yeah, so here, here, here it is. Mi querida Petita Plumita my little crane. I hope that when you read this letter, we are one day closer to being together again. It is so difficult to try to explain to you why we are apart. I have trouble understanding it myself. I have been so worried, amorcito, because mommy and the baby are so sick and, you, and worried you are all alone in that place. I don't know how things got so mixed up. I don't know how this all will turn out. All I can say is I'm sorry. I am so, so sorry, Betita. I hope one day you will find a way to understand and forgive me. Fernanda, that's the attorney, tells me how brave you have been and about how you taught people to fly into the beauty of their suffering, like I've always reminded you to do and how that has changed things for so many. You've always been so good at flying. I'm especially grateful for the crane poems you sent me. I don't know which one is my favorite. Each one made my heart soar, made me feel so close to you, but also some made me cry because I cannot believe how much you have been through. And I wish to be there, flying together because you do you fly like a toquilcoyot inside these poems and pictures, even if you think your wings are gone. I have tried to write crane poems to you too. Some were not so good, so I only included the best ones here, the ones with mas sentimiento like you do it. I tried, I really did. When I see you again, I will have to be a better student. Before I end this letter, I want you to take something straight into the center of your bones. You are the daughter and granddaughter of people who work hard at all things. We work hard to love, to live a decent life, to be and do good, to be one of the many cranes that migrate, searching for a safe home. Please don't ever forget that. Please don't ever forget you come from this flight for freedom. I love you from here to where the stars never end. Amor eterno, tu papi. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you, Aida. Thank you so, so much. Um, you can imagine the round of applauses that are going around because this is such a needed story, you know? Um, there's so many children who are separated from their from their families in 
you know, in the border and they face, um, you know, a true militarized border. So for a child, for anyone really, you know, how scary that is, you know, and uh, for our most vulnerable. So thank you so much for, for writing for our most vulnerable and for the courage, you know, to, to say the story and to describe the realities through your novel and verse, your, your story and verse. Um, before we transition, I just wanna say, um, please feel free students and anyone who's in the call today, uh, drop your questions into the Q&A or through the chat. Uh, Professor Ochoa and I will be monitoring that. So we'll make sure to uplift your question. Okay, with that, I'm gonna uh, segue to uh, Dr. Ochoa. Enrique, thank you. Um, thank you, Leti. Um, yeah, and thank you, Aida Salazar, for really that beautiful, powerful reading um, and, and the story, right? The importance of, of the stories of, kind of resistance and understanding, right? They go really uh, deep. Um, so I wanna thank you for that and look forward to discussing uh, a little bit more. As we, as we continue. Um, I also, again, wanna welcome everyone uh, here. Um, really, it's great to share space with so many people who are right in different, came here for different classes. There are many, we can see in the chat, many different uh, librarians from all across the state, um, right? Students from Cal State LA in different classes, but I also saw some Monterey Bay folks. I saw some folks from Oxnard, right? They're, they're, it's really exciting. Um, so again, uh, thank you. Um, really now it's my pleasure, really my great pleasure to introduce uh, Doctora Oriel Maria Su um, with us. Um, I, I think Zooming directly from Honduras um, from today. And, and Doctora Su is from San Pedro Sula, Honduras, the daughter to a strong and mighty Pipil Salvadoran Guatemalan mother and a dedicated Chinese Nicaraguan father. Oriel had to leave her homeland for Los Angeles, California in 1997. She's, she has since dedicated herself to the creation of cultural and academic spaces for the growing Centro Americano, Centro Americana, black, brown communities in the US, helping to establish the first Central American Studies program at Cal State University Northridge in 1999 and founding the Latino Latina Studies Program at the University of Puget Sound in Washington in 2012. Uh, Doctora Sue is a strong proponent of ethnic studies, contributing her research, writing and teaching to sustaining and expanding the field. Doctora Sue holds a master's in Latin American literature from UC Berkeley, a, a PhD uh, in cultural studies from UCLA has taught courses on race, immigration, Central America, Chicanx, Latinx literatures, and publishing a number of articles, uh, chapters, academic works on these topics in a, in a, in a variety of uh, uh, journals and books uh, in the US and internationally. She's also taught at UCLA, University of Puget Sound, Chapman and Loyola University. After becoming a mother in 2013, she encountered the problems that that, that many of us do, right? That all socially conscious parents face. And that is the lack of inspiring, empowering, historically on point and culturally sensitive books uh, for children of color in the US, right? Just the, this, I mean, we can see the dearth of, of, of critical books. So she decided to write her own. She's now working on um, what we'll hear uh, about Rebeldita the Fearless, Rebeldita la Alegre, but it, it seems to be a series of books um, that she's publishing um, by right, community-based Isote Press. Uh, Dr. Su centralizes the power of children vis-a-vis -vis destructive ogre forces living in society. In 2012, she was selected one of the she was selected one of the top 10 new Latino Latinx authors by Latino Stories for her contributions in children's literature. Right, students in my class um, know Dr. Su for really her. Her, her powerful and, and cutting and really on point article, uh, White by Design, uh, the United States' long and enduring family of a history of family separation, a call to intervention, right? Which, which Rebeldite clearly is, right? Among the many calls uh, Dr. Sue has been, been making. Um, 
So really, please join me. Uh, actually, one thing I do want to say, and hopefully she'll talk a little about this too later on, is that Rebeldita the Fearless in Overland really is, is illustrated by her sister, uh, the artivist and muralist and painter Alicia Maria Su. Uh, and again, I, right, sibling, siblings working together. There are not a lot of us that do that, um, but I like to uplift when, when they are as I um, right, work closely with my sister. So with that, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Su here to our Cal State LA space. Thank you, thank you. De verdad, muchas gracias. Thank you so much to all the organizers. I know what it takes for these kinds of events to happen. I am greeting everyone today from the land of the Lenca, the Maya, the Garifuna, the Misquito, also called Honduras by the colonizers. I am in San Pedro Sula and it's truly uh, beautiful. Um, I just feel so grateful to be able to be here with you uh, using our words um, and uh, allowing us to share our work. Um, so today, if you allow me, I would love to uh, share with you a reading of Rebeldita, the Fearless. And uh, if you allow me to share my screen, I will go ahead and do this here. A ver. ¿Todos pueden ver? ¿Sí? Bien. Ok, so this is Rebeldita the Fearless in Overland. <clears throat> oh, so sorry. Hold on one second. Long slide right here. As el profe Ochoa said, it is illustrated by my amazing sister. I just have the honor, privilege, the luck of being her sister. I have, uh, I have seen her since we were growing up here in Honduras. I have seen her develop her art and just grow into an amazing, talented, beautiful voice through colors. Uh, she's left murals all over uh, Central America, in Mexico, in Zapatista communities, in many places in California. I believe there's one in Cuba as well, uh, one, a mural of hers um, as well in Cuba, northern part of Mexico. I am truly um, humbled to be her sister. Uh, it was quite a challenge working with your sister though. I, I have a lot of stories uh, of that. Um, the book, I originally wrote it in Spanish. I don't write in English. Um, and so it's been, translated beautifully by Matthew Byrne. What you're going to hear today is a translation by Matthew Byrne. Um, as I wrote, uh, and I write only in Spanish, for some reason, I have still been unable to creatively write in English. So Spanish just comes out. Um, uh, even after 23 years in the United States, I just recently came back to Honduras and that's another story. Um, so this is a book I dedicated and I dedicate to all children living in Ogreland and to my two rebelditas who are uh, my daughter Suletu Ichagbal, Richard Sue, and to my niece Ayotli Ocelot uh, for many, many reasons. They inspire me and also they are a, an amazing source of strength. They are my light. Um, Ayotli in particular had to, uh, to deal with the deportation of her father. And uh, I've learned and gained a lot of strength from her, seeing her grow up uh, and also seeing her use her voice. Um, I also want to say uh, that this is a book that was somewhat collectively written. Um, the way I work when I write is I, I speak out loud because I, I write in rhyme. I'm a poet. So I write in rhyme, so I, uh, I, I, speak out, I speak the words because I need to hear them to see if they flow. And so in that process of speaking my words, uh, you know, my daughter would jump in or my niece would jump in or I would think of something else after someone jumps in. So it, so it has, um, it has the, the, uh, the words of um, my niece and my daughter here as well, who both uh, came up with some rhymes. <clears throat> Rebeldita, the fearless in Overland. Come gather around children, this story's about to start. It's really quite special because it's different at heart. Once upon a time, nope, it's not one of those. There once was so-and-so a long time ago. Nope, nope, that's certainly not how this story goes. It's really quite different, this story I share with you because unlike the many others, this one is all very true. 
Rebeldita the Fearless is a sparky young girl who dances through life with a bilingual twirl. You'll never catch her in a sulk or a pout or with her arms crossed standing idly about. She's a barrel of laughs and sometimes she's sneaky like you. She's real smart and just a bit cheeky. Inquisitive and chatty, she's, she's got a quick wit. She's never ever afraid, not even a bit. She was born in a place that's not far from here, tucked behind a high wall that looks over you with a sneer. That wall you should know hasn't always been there. Ogres built it on land they stole, they just didn't care. They didn't ask nice, they didn't say please. They just built that wall wherever they pleased. That was 500 years ago, what a terrible day when those ogres decided they'd take everything away. Everyone knew this was not at all fair. Too bad, the ogres barked, it's ours we declare. That very huge wall, Rebeldita's parents crossed. They had no choice but to do it, despite all it cost. Over mountains and deserts, come hell or high water, they endured months of sore feet. It was all for their daughter. The journey was grueling and tired they were, but they needed a new home of this, they were sure. If you ask about the crossing, Rebeldita won't remember because she was only a baby in her mother's arms held tender. And though Rebeldita was not born in ogre land, she still feels its home and calls it her homeland. Today, Rebeldita has a great many friends, but those wicked ogres have her at her wit's end. They're always cloaked in the finest silk thread with guard dogs on leash wherever they tread. They think they're hot stuff, what pie in the sky in well-shined shoes and, la and giant long ties. Dressed to the nines, they think nobody sees their wicked intentions swaying in the breeze. They're not very bright as I bet you can see. For 500 years, their breed's been well known. They wanted all everything for themselves alone. They hoard all of the land and all of its treasures and stealing from others, they seem to take pleasure. Justice has long gone here with ogres in charge year after year. They rule over land with an iron fist. It's sad to explain, but I'll give you the gist. When the sun goes down, they come knocking on doors. They break into people's homes, maybe even yours. They do it for fun. It's all just for kicks. They've done it many times before, 12 million and six. Parents and children are captured alive, locked up and caged by the ogres far and wide. Without any parents left in their homes, children are left crying all very alone. No places to play and no fields left to roam. For children in Ogreland, joy is all gone. The other day at school, as Rebelita played outside, she found her friend Florcita with tears in her eyes. What happened, Florcita? ¿Qué te pasa, Florcita? She asked, horrified. The ogres came by last night, Florcita sniffled and said, so I had to act quiet while I hid under my bed. In the dark of the night, I couldn't see right, but I heard them barge in at the stroke of midnight. They stormed through our front door and stomped on the floor, yelling and screaming that we had to go. My mother said, never, this is our home. My daughter is here, we'll never let go. Unless you obey, said the ogres, you're going to pay. And for not giving in, they snatched my mama away. Hearing her friend cry, Rebelita was steaming. So she put out a call to begin serious scheming. Under the big save a tree at five on the dot, let's gather together and let's tackle a plot. 2,000 children arrived right then and right there. And soon there were thousands more gathered in the town square. So many like Florcita were so very mad that ogres would take their mom or their dad. Rebelita started. This ends right now. Then Florcita joined in shouting, this we won't allow. Standing together, we've got strength and great might. 
we outnumber the ogres and their snarling hounds, all right. I've got some ideas, said a little girl. I've got like three more, shared a boy named Earl. And from dusk till dawn, they polished the plan. Working together, their movement began. No students were present at school the next day because their plan called for helpers to help save the day. Without second thought, they went to the grandmas. Their grandmas agreed, agreed they were sick of the trauma. At the grandmother's sides, who'd never lead them astray, they found the perfect recipe and their plan was underway. For an abuelita's recipe is quite a powerful brew in anyone's hands to combat any ogre in view. Only the finest of spices their grandma stirred in. These bones must be irresistible, they said with a grin. Their secret ingredient was love overflowing, sprinkled right in, that's why it's shiny and glowing. All over town, the smell was delicious. Bones simmered with love and also very nutritious. Later that day, at the agreed upon time, Rebeldita whistled louder than the loudest wind chime. From every corner of town, each kid knew what it meant. Time to bust open cages, we'll never relent. Thousands of children now took to the streets. They sang their chants loud, they kept stomping their feet. They wouldn't let up, all cages must break. Their footsteps were making the entire town quake. And when they got to the cages, they quickly surrounded those dastardy ogres who looked shocked and astounded. But back into a quarter, the ogres wouldn't hold back. They had already commanded their dogs to attack. Facing the dogs and their giant sharp fangs, Revelita started off with a big, big bang. Power to the children, she roared with all of her might. And Florcita followed suit, shouting, we came here to fight. Last night, we united and thought up a plot to get rid of you ogres, and now's our best shot. Standing real firm, they all reached in their pockets, grabbing their secret weapons as fast as a rocket. Instantly captivated, the hounds wanted to savor the exquisite aroma and mouth-watering flavors. Mmm, what a savory, flavorful, and just delicious smell, howled the dogs. And wouldn't you believe it, the hounds lurched for the bones, slobbered and drooled. They forgot about attacking, totally fooled. They gnawed at their bones, so completely bewitched that in a few seconds their alliances had switched. Never before had these hounds so enjoyed such wonderful food made with love and pure joy. The ogres only fed them rotten dinners with flies, so these delicious bones were a sight for sore eyes. The plan had worked. The snarly dogs, oh, they soon realized that they did deserve love. Those awful ogres had lied. The children's power of love began to transform what were once hateful hounds into friends loyal and warm. Wow, 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 the hounds slurped up a commotion. Their faces smiled bright as wide as an ocean. And like that, the second part of the plan was set into motion. The, the dogs and the kids set off side by side with hope in their eyes, each brimming with pride. All alone, with no more protection, the ogres felt their power collapse from every direction. Never before had the ogres even thought that their power, that the power, sorry, that their power could be challenged or by children fraught. Oh, for those ogres, it must have been quite the fright because their waxy faces all turned a ghastly white. And who could blame them for shaking in fear? There were thousands of children before them. Oh dear, an, an ocean in fact, of brave girls and loud boys who wouldn't give up shouting justice, what noise? For miles and miles, you could hear them all say, away with the ogres without any delay. Rebeldita and the children made their way through the throng. Arm in arm, they stood firm, so brave and so strong. Power to the children, united they chanted. Keep our families together, you can't take us for granted. Panicked, the ogres tripped on their ties, falling backwards towards the cages they had placed behind. And because they were huge, they broke open the cages, falling right in. The scene was one for history's pages. 
to put on their plan the finishing touch. Rebeldita and the children locked them up in a rush. The children then waved and flashed the big smile saying bye bye ogres in classic ogre language and rebeldita style. A taste of their own medicine is exactly what the ogres got trapped in the very same cages that they themselves had bought. Children and parents all lit up with glee. They ran out of those cages. They were finally free. They cheered and cheered. Their wounds could now heal. It's come to an end, this awful ordeal. And what a joy it was too, so much love and full view. Parents and children, thousands and all reunited at last was a long overdue. Something had changed, like the land had been cleared. That big ugly wall, it's all disappeared. One day it was there, the next it was not. The kids tore it down as part of their plot. They knew it well now, they pulled back the curtain. They had to make change, that much was quite certain. A world without walls, without cages or fear is exactly the wall, the world, sorry, is exactly the world that we must hold very dear. Revelita proclaimed in a voice unashamed, grown-ups and kids, plants and animals too, each with equal rights, injustice can shoe. And here, my careful listeners, though this has been fun, is where this story ends, yet it's just barely begun. You're part of it too, so I want you to know that you can join Rebeldita, build this world, yes, anew. Because this wonderful world is about to dawn where everyone's free and ogres be gone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, beautiful, fearless book, right? A fearless writing of the book, a fearlessness of, of youth. Um, right before the ogres get to youth, it really, I love the way that is. Right there, are, of course, multiple kinds of ogres all throughout the land, and 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 again, very beautiful the way and powerful the way. Right, you, you, you through uh, Rebeldita kind of speaks truth to that power, kind of calls out those ogres back to colonialism, right, and racism and other other hierarchies of power that get put in to the. Cap, racial capitalist system as it as it emerges and the way that goes up and and again I love the way of course this this doesn't hide the facts from children from kids as we so often do so really thank you for those that story and uh, and and again yeah just so much there um, with that maybe we can move into our discu our our discussion our conversation and begin and again I want to remind um, folks to pose any questions or comments you have in the chat, or of course you can do it on the question and answer in the Q&A. Um, and you can already see, right, the power people are, are, are have from uh, hearing the readings for the kids that are in the, that are in our space, that are in our, in the room, so to speak, with us all. Uh, and I guess I, I, I really want to begin with this first question here that, um, that we've been, that, uh, Letty and I were talking about really Rebeldita and Betita both really resist right the ogres of U.S. Empire, um, and they and they take action and they draw from deep histories, deep knowledges, right? Some might call it community cultural wealth. We might call it otros saberes, right? That are there that have been pushed under, that have been submerged um, through colonialism, through patriarchy, um, throughout that that process and then you show right both of you show how um how students i mean how kids can take action and do take action in various ways so maybe you can tell us a little bit about why you chose to write about and show children um resisting um and draw and resisting in these various forms um what are some of the creative powers that rebeldita and betita draw from we can we begin with we can begin there who wants to start either way i'll start since i am muted um okay well so i believe that um we as a society really underestimate society is at large we always underestimate children 
Mm -hmm. um, we underestimate their, their voices to create change um, quite often. And, um, you know, I come from social justice movements um, in, in my own life through the arts. And in this book, I wanted to show how the arts, the writing of poetry and, and, and um, visual arts, a picture together would be a way for my character to gain liberation, how she could set herself and others free. And, and that was very intentional because the arts have set me free as a person, as a, as a writer. Um, and so, so I wanted to do that for Betita. And I think also often when we um, look at the media, look at many depictions of immigrants, they're seen as the victim at this, as this person who has like no control over their situation. And, and I wanted to make sure that m my character had the power of, of agency, that the character could uh, write and, and move mountains with, and, and, and draw and could move mountains with her work. And so it was really critical for me to have that piece um, and to, to show children that, you know, it's, it's often said that, that Rudine Sims Bishop quote where, you know, children need to be able to see themselves reflected on the page as a mirror. And then they should also be able to see themselves Oh, it's, uh, and books can be a window into other worlds that they didn't know and, and sliding glass doors where they can enter that world. But I, I would like to take that one step further and, and offer a roadmap to children. And that when the reader, the young reader reads this and says, if Betita in her darkest moment, in the most horrific, uncontrollable circumstances is able to rise above the hate and the, the, the difficulty and use her art as a voice, then I can too. So I wanted children to, to have a roadmap um, for, for, my, for, for their, their own liberation in whatever circumstance, not necessarily this one, but in whatever circumstance. Great, yes. Go ahead, Oria. Go ahead, yes. Um, you know, I could go ahead and, you know, we could theorize and, and academics, we do this a lot, we theorize about resistance, but I'm going to speak from the perspective and experience of becoming a mother. I became a mother in 2013 to a black, indigenous and Chinese child, visually black. Um, and so obviously the first thing I do is, ah, what am I going to read to her? What are we going to read? And so I start, we start going to libraries, even since I was, ever since I was pregnant, we started going to libraries. And uh, I, I really had a very frustrating time in every library, and this was Seattle. You know, Seattle has some of the most amazing libraries with amazing collections, great, huge collections, and public libraries are everywhere. They're very easy to find. Yet, uh, every single time I was in front of those estantes, no? I, I would bring down a book and I would you know, I would start look, skimming through it and I said, no, okay, so again, it's centering the experience of white children. Again, okay, more princess characters. Oh my goodness, you've no idea how many princess characters that, that stay within the, that do not critique or even question, no, the, the history behind um, uh, royal, royals, no, la, la realezas in the United States, in the Americas, you know, we, we put out these uh, images of prince and princesses without realizing how, how much we are obscuring and silencing the histories of the Americas by mythifying these, um, these characters. And so, no, I'm not gonna read you princess characters. Um, uh, problem problematic gender constructions or gender stereotypes, racial stereotypes, um, and so as I continue digging deeper and trying to figure out what's going, you know, I begin to do some research. Uh, University of Madison, Wisconsin has come out with some amazing research on children's literature. And so they found that there are more characters um, with animals, char animal characters, than there are children of color in the United States. Okay, and of course we know that the majority over 50% of characters represented within children's books today are white. And then um, 
to a very lesser than then come animals and then come all the children of color. And then there was the problem of representation. So even when I found books, right? So even when I found books featuring children of color, these were extremely problematic representations. Either they were shallow, hollow, uh, vacias, I'm not sure how you say it in English right now. Yeah, hollow um, celebrations, hollow celebrations of diversity, right? With no mention or no addressing of the actual lived, daily lived experience of children of color. And so I ended up reading to my child, to my daughter, a lot of uh, science books. <laughs> we went for the science books or we went for the math books. We, we went for numbers. Um, around that time in 2013, um, you know, Obama was already on at the height of his uh, deporting. Um, and so that's something else that came into, it was a big factor in this particular story. But uh, you, you, the question specifically was about resistance. And so I needed to write for my daughter and to provide to her a, a um, avenues through which she knew and she was, uh, and she could be very proud to come from long lines, hundreds and hundreds of years of lines of ancestry, of ancestors who resisted. You know, we are here because we've survived and we've resisted. And so uh, it was very important for me not just to bring content and history, but also to, to, to manifest and express and to highlight uh, that we are not um, just um, passive. Um, passive characters in books, you know, that we, I wanted her to have all the power. She, I wanted her to have a different uh, uh, opportunities, possibilities. I wanted to potentiate the possibility of her imaginary by thinking outside of Eurocentric lenses, you know? And so that's, um, that's what I am uh, doing this uh, Rebeldita the Fearless series. Um, I really want to potentiate the capacity of children to imagine their world or many worlds, however they best see that that, that is absolutely doable and possible and that they come from lines of people who have uh, done this for centuries. And so um, it's very important for me as a writer to, to ensure that we're not just presenting a problem, but that, but that we are um, allowing for the space for children to know that they are fully capable of transforming their reality. Yes, thank you so, so much, Dr. Asiu, for saying that, because I think um, a lot of times, like when we, when we you know, consider the, wor the word futurity or future, um, we forget actually that, you know, we like exactly how you said, you know, there is a, a genealogy, a lineage of um, enduring struggle. You know, you could even give it the date, you know, 1492, the date that so many um, students like myself, for instance, who are brought up in public education in the United States are like drilled to memorize that. And I really, I really also love how both of you in, in your works, um, really show the power of uh, children, you know, to actualize um, and to dream up different ways, new ways of living, you know, ways that are outside of um, the kinds of systems that, you know, colonial, settler colonial and uh, racist systems that keep us um, defined and bounded, you know, to particular realities. Um, I, there's so many questions in my mind right now. We also have many, many questions that are coming in. So I wanted to um, just ask one other question perhaps to keep in mind as we go through the, um, the student questions that are coming from the Q&A. Um, um, I wanted to ask if you could consider um, sharing a little bit about the importance of writing about children with indigenous, uh, Asian, and Afro-Latinx heritages in both of your respective works. There's a question in here um, that um, from Brittany that is asking about personal experiences that have contributed to your story. So perhaps maybe weaving both of those questions, mm -hmm. personal experiences. Okay. 
Oh, the mute. Don't forget the mute. <laughs> Aida? Oh, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, yeah, the, my character, um, Rebeldita, no, is clearly, clearly uh, indigenous and black. No? In fact, she's wearing a Lenka, she's wearing a Lenka dress. I'm sorry, the Lenka handkerchief and a Nove dress. And uh, I wanted to ensure that she was visually black, right? Clearly black, uh, as well as my sister. And because um, Rebeldita is a child, she's born out of the realities of occupied America, no? And so I needed to center the experience of indigenous and black at the core of how I represented this character and the lineage and the trajectory that she was going to follow. Um, and also because it's just important to see, you know, as we know uh, what children see and what they don't see, what they hear, what they do not hear, what they read, what they do not read is, you know, it goes to the core to shape who they are. And so, um, um, and so it was extremely important and, and, um, and, all, and the series is going to follow in that direction. Absolutely, not leaving that behind. And I can answer the next one too, but I would, uh, I'm gonna give to Aida and then we can continue like that. Um, well, I, I, um, both of my books have, have, have children like, so I'll show you a cover of The Moon Within here. She's Afro, uh, Afro Puerto Rican Mexicana uh, child. And it's the first time we've ever seen in children's literature, a child of this particular um, mix. And and uh, Betita is is uh, is detribalized indigenous person. You know, she's she's uh, born in Mexico with her family and has come to the United States. But like many Mexicans and Mexican Americans, Chicanx folks living in the United States, we do not have um, any real connection to our ancestral um, indigenous traditions and you know though many indigenous uh, communities continue to thrive and resist in the Americas um, many of us are are detribalized and and separate separated from that that reality and those traditions and in the moon within the other book um, it was really a lot about reclaiming those traditions via a moon ceremony a, a coming of age first period ceremony so you know, a lot of that work went into researching and in incredibly, the I was able to find through a friend, Dr. David Bowles, um, a, a poem, which is the only written documentation before European contact about a moon ceremony. And it's included in this book. It's called Flower Song Coming of Age uh, for, for young women, young maiden coming of age. And so, so, you know, our history has, our hi written histories have been eradicated as we know because of colonization. And so to me, it's really important to not only reclaim and revive these traditions, including the myth of Aslan, um, uh, because it, it edifies us. It helps us um, connect and, 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 um, and use it and use it for empowerment. It's not just a connection. It's really about um, having children understand the complexity of their identity and the history that they that, that comes with that. So I write um, in those forgotten spaces. I write to unearth, to reimagine, to reconnect, to reclaim, to, to heal ultimately to heal from the forces of colonization that have, have really damaged us as, as, as communities across the Americas, so. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Aida. No, no, I was gonna answer the second question, but, but go ahead. <laughs> well, I was, um, I was just thinking right now, thank you so much for mentioning uh, David Bowles because uh, he's another, he's a Chicano author also of youth literature. And this is the 25th anniversary of the Pura Belpre Award for uh, uh, children's literature. And um, it's recognized as, you know, one of the, you know, biggest prizes in children's literature for Latinx children's literature. But 
oftentimes when we talk about the Pura Bel Pre Award, we don't say that uh, Pura Bel Pre, the first Boricua Black Puerto Rican librarian, um, was really at the foundation of establishing children's library services as we know it today, bilingual story times, culturally sustaining community programs are all things that Pura Bel Pre, through the course of her career, um, you know, almost like the whole 20th century practically, you know, gave to us. So really happy that you, you put that, um, that, you know, called our attention to that. Um, because I think it calls to another question that's coming up in the chat that a couple of people have asked in terms of getting your books um, getting Rebeldita, getting uh, The Moon Within, The Land of the Cranes, and your other books, that, all the other books that are subsequent coming um, into the hands of our children at the site of schools and libraries. So there's a question is, you know, how do we get these books? Um, so if maybe both of you would want to um, talk a little bit about that and maybe the connections between storytelling, knowledge making, resistance and pedagogy. Mm -hmm. Are we going, should we not answer the other question? The other question about, about our connection to um, our personal experiences? Oh, connection? yes, I, I, yes, forgive me, please. I completely I forgot that one. Okay, that's why we'll okay. put it. Go to the personal connection first. Yes, and then we'll <laughs> okay. do the next one. Uh, mine will be brief. I, I'll just say, <laughs> I was born in Mexico and I was brought over to, from the United States when I was a, a little a baby and nine months old. And, and, and my family was undocumented till I was about 12 years old. And so my family, uh, you know, I didn't have to look very far to, to know intimately the, the stories. I was, I've never been um, inside a detention center, but I know plenty of people in my immediate family who have been deported or who have, have um, been incarcerated for a misdemeanor, which is, you know, being in the United States without authorization. And so this book is, um, is a story that I had to write for us. Um, thank you for sharing that, Aida. Um, I mentioned Obama, I mentioned my niece. Um, when um, I saw, I would see my niece at the detention center, you know, they, they had this big, huge glass between them the last time they saw each other, this big, huge glass between them. And so all they could do is he placed his hand here and she would place right like that, right? And that was a very uh, impactful image that stayed with me. Um, uh, and as I mentioned, at the same time, it was very clear where Obama was going, that he was not going to stop the deportation machinery. This was 2012, 2013. At the same time, you know, so many of us were out on the streets here, in the, there in Los Angeles. Um, and so I, um, that was very important for me to, uh, I just felt I needed to write the story. It just, it needed to come out and it needed to be from the perspective of this Afro-Indigenous and, and we needed to break so many borders, you know, not just the physical ones, but the the, the mental, the, the non-physical borders that impeded um, our children to be able to imagine other worlds, you know, or alternatives. Um, the other big, big uh, factor uh, why I decided to write children's book is my experiences as a college professor, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I taught ethnic studies for over 14 years and, um, and uh, all my freshmen, mo all my freshman courses, most students, I would say like 90% of students still today, as, you, as many of you here will know, are coming in with very mythified ideas, with very um, uh, fairy tale notions and ideas of US history and of the Americas. You know, they have no idea, you know, um, because, and it's, it's, to not, it's not to their fault. It's not their fault. Um, it, it is because our educational system, K through 12, is failing us, you know, and it's failing at the epistemic level and at many other levels. And so, um, and and so, I just I just knew it was important that we rupture and we undo these myths and these fairy tales, and uh, and that we needed and that I needed to focus my attention on 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 producing material that was to be read. Uh, 
early on in the elementary uh, stages. So my mission, you know, is to contribute to ethnic studies uh, material um, for it to be read in the in the schools. And this goes to your next the next question you make is how extremely hard because uh, I published Rebeldita with uh, it was Isote Press who published Rebeldita. Isote Press is a small publishing house out of Los Angeles. Okay, very small. Uh, created by Mario Escobar, Dr. Mario Escobar, he who is also um, um, Central American. He's from El Salvador, and he's gone through so much turmoil just sustaining that tiny space, you know. And so, it's very difficult for small publishing houses to have the reach um, that other big publishing houses have. I, I was denied entrance into many publishing houses. I knocked on doors, and um, and all said no. And so I said. You know, and I truly believe what I'm about to say is, you know, do not stop writing for those of you who are, uh, are writers and want to publish. You know, now there are many ways in which we can sustain and uplift our own voices. You know, it's, it's the time has passed when we had to wait for the white man to publish us. Um, I truly do believe that um, we have the responsibility and the obligation to our children and to our communities to create our own writing spaces and also spaces of, of producing those and to disseminate those. And so community here, uh, the ones who have, uh, people who have bought Rebeldita, you know, has mostly been through our social media networks, but oh my goodness, I so wish I, you know, we knew better ways of getting into the schools because if that, would that not be amazing if we can get these voices you know, these books into as many libraries and schools as possible. But that is a situation when you publish with small publishing houses, it's very difficult the, to, to reach to all these spaces. Um, and so that's some, also something to keep in mind and something we need to learn how to do. I need to learn. I, 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 I want to know. <laughs> Help. <laughs> yeah, for, for me, the, the question, um, was a little bit of like uh, selling my, my soul to the devil. <laughs> you know, I mean, really g getting published by Scholastic, which is a, one of the biggest presses for children in the United States and has been for a really long time, was, um, was giving up a, 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 in, in some respects how far my book would go, but, um, um, or, or the control I had about over my book, but only a little bit. And so I was able to, because I had a good representation, a good agent, which I, I recommend, you know, uh, for aspiring writers to look for a good agent. Um, I had a good agent who protected me and protected me from cens censorship and in the moon within in particular, because it was about taboo topics The the has been censored. It's been censored from many, many schools. I don't get invited to school visits big for that book at all and and it's, it's simply about menstruation it has a gender queer ch character and and in in the land of the cranes i am getting invited to to do school visits because somehow the incarceration and the extreme brutality and violence that is you know perpetrated against it, it, asylum seekers in this country is somehow easier to to, to teach children than menstruation. So, you know, go figure. But, but I've not, haven't been censored. And, and because of Scholastic, who has in, in, in their own right also censored me, um, like they didn't uh, create um, an audiobook for The Moon Within because they said, you know, audiobooks are generally read aloud by families and they didn't feel like the, the content was appropriate for younger children. And, 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 but they did translate into Spanish. So there is like a little bit of censorship there, but, but um, for Land of the Cranes, it's gotten a lot of attention in terms of, of, you know, it has a Spanish translation that's coming out in, um, in the, in the fall. And then, and an audiobook, which I think is a question of equity and access. I'm such a huge fan of the library system because the libraries are are are, are gateway are, are gateway into readers and librarians at schools in particular are also are a way in so so but 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 we still live in a very white um, uh, society that that supports narratives that have a proximity to whiteness 
So you you will see even among the Pura Bel Pre Award, and I, you know, my mis respetos, but they will not touch controversial books. They will not touch, uh, you know, any kind of book that's going to make anybody clutch their pearls. You know what I'm saying? So so that's you know, but, but that with those kinds of awards, those kinds of prestigious awards, that allows you entrance into into um, classrooms. And luckily, Land of the Cranes did get a Charlotte Huck Award, which is by the National Con uh, uh, Convention of Teachers of English. And that gives it, you know, a, a green light in some, some respects, but, um, but it's, it, it's subjective. It's very subjective, you know, because it's a group of eight people in a room or whatever, 10 people and on a committee who, who select it. And if your book doesn't make it through that eight, eight committee of eight, subjective committee of eight, then you don't get as much play. So it's still a challenge. And, <clears throat> and people also dismiss our stories, even if they're published in mainstream presses. So, um, but you know, we're, we're fighting the good fight within the, the monster in the machine. No, and definitely, right? It's so, I mean, these are such important stories. Um, so important to kind of have them in classrooms, right, for those of us who've been part of the long struggle for ethnic and gender studies, critical ethnic and gender studies in K through 12 in particular, aside from the university, right? They're, they're just a lack of material. And, and always it's kind of like a chicken and egg thing. Well, I talk to principals and they say, well, yeah, there's no material, what will we use? Well, we have some material. Well, no, no, we can't use it. And so, right, the danger of, I think something that Aida just said, the danger really of multicultural neoliberalism Right is real. I mean, on the on the surface, talking about these subjects, yes, uh, is great. It opens the door, right, for us to move in and subvert those spaces. But oftentimes they're used to police, right? Real stories that talk about power, that talk about the lived reality and experiences, under the guise of protecting the children, under the guise of right all other forms of acceptability, quote unquote. Um, and and again, right. It's all that, all that, all the more fearlessness, right? You all show by doing this, the courage it takes mm -hmm. um, to do it. But, My, go ahead. But I should say, Enrique, that that it's also uh, it it the onus is on the educators too, yeah. the educators and librarians who need to um, to be brave as well. We're doing a we're part. We, you know, we're bringing literature that that has that courage. But 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 it takes courage for you, and I know a lot of work for you all to 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 fight for controversial books or fight books that are 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 resisting the the master narrative. Okay. So thank no, you for no, being no. brave. <laughs> well, you're so right, right? It's so important, and that's why I think these kind of readings and getting and getting and I'm great to see all the future teachers out there, um, oh. right? In, in the you Learn program and in other programs out there, right? It's so important to, to begin to, if you're in volunteering in classes, bring these books in, right? Read them, don't get them. I mean, these are, these are children's books. They don't need to be, they don't need to be reviewed by anybody. They could just be read. Um, you both also have, I just want to point out, right? Both also have curricular guides, right? For the use in, in, in K through 12 classes and, and how teachers can approach them and how families can approach the books as well. And so mm -hmm. folks should check that out. The la one last question I maybe we kind of begin to end with is a question that a few people are asking. And Natalia asked it and, and Sydney has asked it. Um, how have, how have you, how have folks received your books, given the nature of them, given the fact that they're dealing with resistance and power? Um, and, and how, yeah, how do people re respond? How have audiences respond, parents, schools? What are some of the feedback um, that you're getting? Go ahead. <laughs> Um, you know, I, uh, children, when they, I, I read to children yesterday and they, and, uh, what, they love it. They, they identify directly with the character. They say, I am Rebeldita. That's me. You know, I am Rebeldita. And, uh, that means the world to me. Um, a lot of parents have thanked me because, uh, one, one thing that I, that I, that this book is doing is, is, is giving, is offering a platform through which 
from which to begin to have conversations mm -hmm. and from which we can begin to educate ourselves on so many topics, right? The border, uh, undocumentedness, uh, the legality of illegality or the illegality of legality, right? Like, what does it mean to build a, a wall or a border on stolen land, right? Who, what's legal, what's illegal, right? Um, and so they thank me because uh, it provides a space. Uh, maybe they don't have the words. I've heard this from teachers as well. One teacher yesterday said, thank you very much because sometimes they don't know how to go about it. And, and stories, the beautiful thing about stories and storytelling is that they allow connections, for connections to happen, right? Through the personal stories that we can share. And so um, those are some, some of the responses. Uh, I also know that uh, people who work with uh, children of deportees, uh, of deported parents are also using my book. Uh, psychologists are using the book to work with children um, so that they're not left in a place of victimization. Um, and, and to have to go through the, the emotions of losing a parent or both parents. And so um, I just feel very humbled and very grateful that I've, I've been able to reach those spaces uh, through writing, through, through writing this series. Great, thank you for that. Are you there? Well, I've had a, a very wide, <laughs> wide uh, reception, different, d d very various, um, I don't know, responses to the books. Um, I've had everything from like, you know, my, uh, my husband's white gra um, grand nephew read the book and, and just like love it. Um, I've had, you know, editors who, who cry. Um, I've had a lot of people who, who a, a young woman who was a book blogger and was like, show, showed her like cathartic tears as she was crying from the book. So I've had those kinds of like very powerful, intense, um, uh, responses a lot on Instagram, people reach out to me and stuff like that. But, um, but, um, I've also had some pushback, um, in, in, with this book, um, in one of, in one of the scenes in the book, uh, one of the little girls is, is molested and, um, and that, um, it, and it's told in a very age appropriate manner. It's not, you know, told, um, I should have read it. In fact, um, it's, it's, it's the little, one of the little girls tells the main character that she's been molested. And, and, um, and so that was, that's been a little bit controversial. So I've had some letters from people being very angry at me and even my own friends who have said, you know, I can't teach this in the classroom because it has that scene. And the same with the other book, you know, in the other book, there was a, there was a, a passage where the, the little girl ex examines her flor, her, her vulva. And it's the first time in children's literature we've ever seen this. But somehow a child exploring their body through metaphor is like taboo. And my, one of my closest friends said, I can't teach this because of this poem in here. And so, you know, so, but for Land of the Cranes also, I had um, some hate mail because the book has had a big uh, audience, but but it has, um, it, it, you know, not everybody, you know, this is, this is meant, I write for Latinx children, period. You know, that's who I write for. But, but because of Scholastic, the book does get to like Wisconsin and like, you know, Ohio or wherever. And, and there are people who are incredibly uh, offended that I would um, support illegal immigration as they, they um, said. So I've had some hate mail. Um, come my way. And that's why, you know, I asked before we started the Zoom that, that if to make sure that we weren't going to have somebody popping in and Zoom bombing, but because, um, because that's a potential. And I think that happens when you speak truth to power. Mm -hmm. I think that happens when people do not want to hear about the very real wounds that this, this government and, and, you know, and many governments in the Americas are inflicting on their own people that create these circumstances. So, so when you point to the wound of the criminalization of migration, that mm -hmm. somehow is, is, is wrong. And mm -hmm. so, you know, but, but that does not mean that we need to, to stop talking about it. In fact, you know, we need to continue to amplify it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, thank you so, so much for speaking so powerfully and, you know, so directly about the power of storytelling, about the power of um, storytelling with children, you know, and the agency um, that our children have. Um, you know, we've come to the end so quickly because I feel like we could continue this conversation forever and ever. And um, I just want you to know, um, Dr. Siu and Aida, that um, many of the questions that came in from the Q&A, even though we didn't address them directly, through you know everything that you shared with us today, a lot of the questions were answered. Um, and I wanna uh, just encourage everybody who's still um, here on the call that um, our Dia del Niñe is not over. We have um, some more storytelling that will happen at 2 p.m. and at 3 p.m. We're gonna read lots of really cool books. Um, so please find um, the link to that um, at our email, I mean, at our um, live, Cal CLA library website. And we'll also be posting the link for how to get into those um, into those reading rooms um, at two and at three. So um, I just want to say on my part before um, I give it over to uh, Enrique to conclude that I'm just so delighted by today's conversation. I'm energized. I'm so happy to know that you have books, subsequent more books that are going to come out in the Reverdita series. Um, that all of us librarians, we should get those books. All of us teachers, we should get those books. Um, Aida, that you also have some books coming out as well. Um, I'm really looking forward to the anthology um, about um, that spotlights uh, immigrants because um, Bianca Diaz is one of my all time favorite children's illustrators. She did um, the One Day House. She's like, I, I love her art and so, um, just thank you so, so very much um, that, you know, she'll be included and thank you so much that you were here with us today. Enrique? No, I just want to echo um, really what Leti said. Yeah, this has really been very powerful and, and right, a great response as well um, from folks coming out that really shows the hunger, right, that's out there for these stories, to hear these stories stories to hear good powerful critical right beautifully written um stories and again i urge folks as well that we put up there um right their personal pages um to to, to go out to fight these are great books are great gifts for people they're great gifts for kids in your lives and again these are this is really story these are stories for children of all ages right all the way up until you know my grandmother who passed the uh, I don't know, by eight months ago or so was 109, right? I, I wish I could read, I wish I would have been able to read uh, these stories to her. So again, thank you, uh, Dr. Rasu. Thank you, Aida Salazar, for joining us. Um, thank you, everyone, um, for participating, for coming in, for sharing your ideas, for coming and attending uh, th this event. And again, we're urging you as well, at the, we have two, two other readings coming up. Um, on the different sites that were posted. So have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, can I just go ahead and say just one tiny thing? Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Leti. Thank you so much, uh, Profe Ochoa, Aida. It was a pleasure to share words with you. Uh, thank you to all the students, everyone here. Um, I hope to be able to connect more. Find us on, I'm on Facebook and on um, Instagram. At Dr. Asiu, and I would love to be able to keep the conversation going either in either of those two spaces. Thank you, thank you. Well, I, I said the same in the in the chat. Muchas gracias, an honor. And and for those of you who are aspiring aspiring writers, continue continue to write, to continue to create, and continue to lift your voices because they matter. Abrazos, gracias. <laughs>